Lesson 3 When Your World is Falling Apart Sabbath Afternoon January 9 As His people returned to their evil ways, the Lord permitted them to be still oppressed by their former enemies, the Philistines. For many years they were constantly harassed and at times completely subjugated by this cruel and warlike nation. They had mingled with these idolaters, uniting with them in pleasure and in worship, until they seemed to be one with them in spirit and interest. Then these professed friends of Israel became their bitterest enemies and sought by every means to accomplish their destruction. Like Israel, Christians too often yield to the influence of the world and conform to its principles and customs in order to secure the friendship of the ungodly. But in the end, it will be found that these professed friends are the most dangerous of foes. Satan works through the ungodly, under cover of a pretended friendship, to allure God's people into sin that he may separate them from him. And when their defense is removed, then he will lead his agents to turn against them and seek to accomplish their destruction. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 558 and 559. We are admonished by the Apostle, Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Paul would have us distinguish between the pure, unselfish love which is prompted by the Spirit of Christ and the unmeaning, deceitful pretense with which the world abounds. This base counterfeit has misled many souls. It would blot out the distinction between right and wrong by agreeing with the transgressor instead of faithfully showing him his errors. Such a course never springs from real friendship. The spirit by which it is prompted dwells only in the carnal heart. While the Christian will be ever kind, compassionate, and forgiving, he can feel no harmony with sin. He will abhor evil and cling to that which is good at the sacrifice of association or friendship with the ungodly. The Spirit of Christ will lead us to hate sin while we are willing to make any sacrifice to save the sinner. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 171 How true was the Savior's friendship for Peter! How compassionate his warning! But the warning was resented. In self-sufficiency, Peter declared confidently that he would never do what Christ had warned him against. Lord, he said, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Verse 33. His self-confidence proved his ruin. He tempted Satan to tempt him, and he fell under the arts of the wily foe. When Christ needed him most, he stood on the side of the enemy and openly denied his Lord. Those who realize their weakness trust in a power higher than self, and while they look to God, Satan has no power against them. But those who trust in self are easily defeated. Let us remember that, if we do not heed the cautions that God gives us, a fall is before us. Christ will not save from wounds the one who places himself unbidden on the enemy's ground. He lets the self-sufficient one, who acts as if he knew more than his Lord, go on in his supposed strength. Then comes suffering and a crippled life, or perhaps defeat and death. This Day with God, page 259 Sunday, January 10 Danger from the North had Ahaz and the chief men of his realm been true servants of the Most High, they would have had no fear of so unnatural an alliance as had been formed against them. But repeated transgression had shorn them of strength. Stricken with the nameless dread of the retributive judgments of an offended God, the heart of the king was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 2. In this crisis, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, bidding him meet the trembling king and say, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, 
Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. The prophet declared that the kingdom of Israel and Syria as well would soon come to an end. If ye will not believe, he concluded, surely ye shall not be established. Verses 4 to 7 and 9. But choosing to lean on the arm of flesh, Ahaz sought help from the heathen. In desperation, he sent word to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7. The request was accompanied by a rich present from the king's treasure and from the temple storehouse. The help asked for was sent, and King Ahaz was given temporary relief, but at what a cost to Judah. Prophets and Kings, pages 328 and 329. In summer, as we look upon the trees of the distant forest, all clothed with a beautiful mantle of green, we may not be able to distinguish between the evergreens and the other trees. But as winter approaches, and the Frost King encloses them in his icy embrace, stripping the other trees of their beautiful foliage, the evergreens are readily discerned. Thus it will be with all who are walking in humility, distrustful of self, but clinging tremblingly to the hand of Christ. While those who are self-confident and trust in their own perfection of character lose their false robe of righteousness when subjected to the storms of trial, the truly righteous who sincerely love and fear God, wear the robe of Christ's righteousness in prosperity and adversity alike. The Sanctified Life, page 11. Courage, fortitude, faith, and implicit trust in God's power to save do not come in a moment. These heavenly graces are acquired by the experience of years. By a life of holy endeavor and firm adherence to the right, the children of God seal their destiny. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 213. Monday, January 11. Attempted Interception There is a science of Christianity to be mastered, a science as much deeper, broader, higher than any human science as the heavens are higher than the earth. The mind is to be disciplined, educated, trained, for we are to do service for God in ways that are not in harmony with inborn inclination. Hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil must be overcome. Often the education and training of a lifetime must be discarded that one may become a learner in the school of Christ. Our hearts must be educated to become steadfast in God. We are to form habits of thought that will enable us to resist temptation. We must learn to look upward. The principles of the Word of God, principles that are as high as heaven and that compass eternity, we are to understand in their bearing upon our daily life. Every act, every word, every thought is to be in accord with these principles. All must be brought into harmony with and subject to Christ. The Ministry of Healing, pages 453 and 454. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, He will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to His will, that when obeying Him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing His service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. The Desire of Ages, page 668. Those who are quieting a guilty conscience with the thought that they can change a course of evil when they choose, that they can trifle with the invitations of mercy and yet be again and again impressed, take this course at their peril. They think that after casting all their influence on the side of the great rebel, in a moment of utmost extremity, when danger compasses them about, they will change leaders. But this is not so easily done. 
the experience, the education, the discipline of a life of sinful indulgence has so thoroughly molded the character that they cannot then receive the image of Jesus. After light has been long rejected and despised, it will be finally withdrawn. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 269 God would have His servants become acquainted with their own hearts. In order to bring to them a true knowledge of their condition, He permits the fire of affliction to assail them so that they may be purified. The trials of life are God's workmen to remove the impurities, infirmities, and roughness from our characters and fit them for the society of pure, heavenly angels in glory. The fire will not consume us, but only remove the dross, and we shall come forth seven times purified, bearing the impress of the divine. My Life Today, page 92 Tuesday, January 12 Another Chance Let us go to the Word of God for guidance. Let us seek for a thus saith the Lord. We have had enough of human methods. A mind trained only in worldly science will fail to understand the things of God. But the same mind, converted and sanctified, will see the divine power in the Word. Only the mind and heart cleansed by the sanctification of the Spirit can discern heavenly things. Brethren, in the name of the Lord I call upon you to awake to your duty. Let your hearts be yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will be made susceptible to the teachings of the Word then you will be able to discern the deep things of God. May God bring His people under the deep movings of His Spirit. May He arouse them to see their peril and to prepare for what is coming upon the earth. Gospel Workers, page 310 Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The human heart, with its conflicting emotions of joy and sorrow, the wandering wayward heart, which is the abode of so much impurity and deceit. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. God knows its motives, its very intents and purposes. Go to Him with your soul all stained as it is. Like the psalmist, throw its chambers open to the all-seeing eye, exclaiming, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. As you see the enormity of sin, as you see yourself as you really are, do not give up to despair. It was sinners that Christ came to save. We have not to reconcile God to us, but, O oh, wondrous love, God in Christ is reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. He is wooing by His tender love the hearts of His erring children. No earthly parent could be as patient with the faults and mistakes of His children as is God with those He seeks to save. No one could plead more tenderly with the transgressor. No human lips ever poured out more tender entreaties to the wanderer than does He. All his promises, his warnings, are but the breathing of unutterable love. Steps to Christ, pages 34 and 35. Naturally, we are self-centered and opinionated. But when we learn the lessons that Christ desires to teach us, we become partakers of his nature. Henceforth, we live his life. The wonderful example of Christ the matchless tenderness with which he entered into the feelings of others, weeping with those who wept, rejoicing with those who rejoiced, must have a deep influence upon the character of all who follow him in sincerity. By kindly words and acts, they will try to make the path easy for weary feet. All around us are afflicted souls. Here and there, everywhere, we may find them. Let us search out these suffering ones and speak a word in season to comfort their hearts. Let us ever be channels through which shall flow the refreshing waters of compassion. The Ministry of Healing, pages 157 and 158. Wednesday, January 13. Sign of a Sun. 
It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John chapter 3 verse 16. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. The Desire of Ages, page 25 Emmanuel, God with us. This means everything to us. What a broad foundation does it lay for our faith. What a hope big with immortality does it place before the believing soul. God with us in Christ Jesus to accompany us every step of the journey to heaven. The Holy Spirit with us as a comforter, a guide in our perplexities to soothe our sorrows and shield us in temptation. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. My Life Today, page 290 The more we think about Christ's becoming a babe here on earth, the more wonderful it appears. How can it be that the helpless babe in Bethlehem's manger is still the divine Son of God? Selected Messages, Book 3, page 128 In contemplating the incarnation of Christ in humanity, we stand baffled before an unfathomable mystery that the human mind cannot comprehend. The more we reflect upon it, the more amazing does it appear. How wide is the contrast between the divinity of Christ and the helpless infant in Bethlehem's manger? How can we span the distance between the mighty God and a helpless child? And yet the Creator of worlds, He in whom was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, was manifest in the helpless babe in the manger. Far higher than any of the angels, equal with the Father in dignity and glory, and yet wearing the garb of humanity. Divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined, and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. The Signs of the Times, July 30, 1896 Thursday, January 14 God is with us! As an earthly shepherd knows his sheep, so does the divine shepherd know his flock that are scattered throughout the world. Ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Jesus says, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 31, and Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1, and chapter 49 verse 16. Jesus knows us individually and is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows us all by name. He knows the very house in which we live, the name of each occupant. He has at times given directions to his servants to go to a certain street in a certain city to such a house to find one of his sheep. The Desire of Ages, page 479 When trouble comes upon us, how often we are like Peter. We look upon the waves instead of keeping our eyes fixed upon the Savior. Our footsteps slide and the proud waters go over our souls. Jesus did not bid Peter come to him that he should perish. He does not call us to follow him and then forsake us. Fear not, he says, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, 
I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Isaiah chapter 43 verses 1 to 3. Jesus read the character of his disciples. He knew how sorely their faith was to be tried. In this incident on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weakness, to show that his safety was in constant dependence upon divine power. Amid the storms of temptation, he could walk safely only as in utter self-distrust he should rely upon the Savior. It was on the point where he thought himself strong that Peter was weak. And not until he discerned his weakness could he realize his need of dependence upon Christ. Had he learned the lesson that Jesus sought to teach him in that experience on the sea, he would not have failed when the great test came upon him. The Desire of Ages, page 382. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, God Will Take Care of His Church, page 282. And, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, An Exalted Privilege, page 480.